Perfect. Hi. Uh, yeah, so I'm uh, talking about blind state chains, uh, something I presented at uh, Scaling Bitcoin in October. Um, basically, what we're trying to achieve here is a UTXO transfer um, with a, a blind signing server. So the server doesn't really know what it's uh, signing. So I was asked to give this talk uh, on Friday, so I had to kind of in, uh, think of something to add to, you know, break something because that's the conference. So what are we breaking? Well, um, I'm trying to break the definition of a payment processor, so what it is to process a payment, to send a payment. And one way to think of that is, um, well, that we already have a few of these protocols that do something along these lines. So for example, if you have a two of two, uh, where there's Alice and Bob, and Bob has a time lock transaction that goes back to Bob, well, the question is, does Alice control the money? Well, uh, the answer to that is no, because if given enough time, uh, the time lock becomes valid, and now Bob can get the money back. So what if Alice never sees this uh, A plus B uh, on-chain transaction and just signs it blindly for Bob? Is it processing payments? Is it doing anything that's payment related? Well, uh, you know, it's questionable, right? Like, it's, it's kind of like, well, the answer is kind of no, right? They're just signing. So the, the observation is that all of the knowledge and power lies with Bob, right? So Bob is the one who's asking for the, the signature. Alice doesn't know what it's signing. Uh, Bob has the time lock transaction. So Bob has the final uh, power over uh, where the money goes. So um, we kind of take this functionality, and uh, obviously this is just kind of a two of two multi-sig, right? This is nothing special. Uh, but we are, uh, you know, we can simplify this into a blind uh, signing server that essentially uh, generates a new key for a user. So that's creating a new chain. And then secondly, uh, that user can then request a blind signature and point to the next user that gets to uh, uh, request a blind signature. And this is appending to the chain. So the server is very basic. Um, all the heavy lifting or all the complexity is really on the client side, and that's kind of what we want to see. A uh, server doesn't do a lot of thinking. It just signs things for people. So the end result is kind of a linear blockchain um, where the first, so the first step is you generate a uh, server key for, uh, let's say, Bob. So now Bob has control over the server key. Bob requests a uh, signature and then instructs the server to listen to Carol. And the Carol requests a signature and tells the server to now listen to Dave, et cetera. So really we're transferring the signing rights in, in, in a blind way, right? Where Alice, where, yeah, Alice the server, uh, is constantly signing for Bob, then Carol, then Dave, one signature per user. Assuming the server is honest, this works. Um, yeah, so just a quick, uh, you know, um, thing that to point out is that state chains require snore signatures, which are hopefully coming soon, uh, adapter signatures, which basically when we have snore we can do uh, L2, which is maybe a little bit farther away, so that might take a little while, and optionally a uh, graph root, which is probably, yeah, that's going to take a while, so we'll, we'll ignore that for now, but it would be nice if it's in there. And uh, yeah, because of that, it works really on any cryptocurrency that supports this, so not just Bitcoin, but you know, my focus has been Bitcoin. Um, so yeah, to just uh, give kind of a, uh, an overview of like how you can use this uh, practically. So, so this might be a little wordy, but uh, later on I'll, I'll have an example with the uh, actual UTXOs that you can kind of visualize. Um, so what uh, Bob does is it creates a transitory key, uh, which is uh, a key that is going to be passed on from user to user to user. So this transitory key is like you know, transit and it's like, yeah, you, don't, you use it once and then you pass it on. You pass on the private key. And, and with this, uh, it takes the server key A and this transitor key X, and it creates a, a, an AX uh, key, right? With Musig on Schnorr, what you can do is you, you, you turn it into a single key. So then, in order to sign with this, uh, this AX uh, public key, you first request a blind signature from the server, and then you sign it with, a, uh, with X. And now, in order to transfer the ownership over this, this AX key, uh, you basically pass on the private key and you pass on the signing rights, right? That's what we do with the blind server. First, Bob was the one who could request the signature from Alice, and now Carol's the one who can request the signature from Alice. 
So here's a, you know, what it would look like. So on the state chain side, we start off with the server uh, now listening to Bob. Bob gets to request the signature. What's the signature Bob uh, asks? Bob asks for an L2 off-chain transaction where he receives, let's say, one Bitcoin. So this is an off-chain transaction, and there's actually no Bitcoin yet, because first, he needs this time-locked transaction that guarantees that he gets the money back, and then he goes and he actually sends a Bitcoin to this AX um, UTXO. So the current state is that Bob now still gets to request a, a signature from the state chain, and if the state chain uh, does nothing, then Bob can just send this uh, off-chain transaction on-chain and receive, get, get his money back. So now Bob asks for another signature, and this signature is another L2 update transaction, where now Carol gets the money after the time expires, and since this is using L2, it means that uh, even if Bob now sends this old off-chain transaction to the blockchain, uh, Carol's transaction actually has uh, um, priority, so Carol can always send hers even after Bob sends uh, the one he has. And now, at the state chain side, it's Carol who gets to uh, decide the next signature. So basically, this is how we pass on a UTXO from person to person to person. And yeah, of course, X is also has to be um, given to, to Carol. So really, you know, Bob and Carol now have the same amount of knowledge. They both know X, uh, and on the state chain side, the, the state chain will only sign on behalf of Carol. Therefore, Bob has no longer any control. So practical results is, yeah, you're, you're changing the ownership without changing the key. And that's kind of something novel. And the server doesn't know X, right? It doesn't have this private key. So really, it has no control. If the server disappears, we have the off-chain transaction that we can send on-chain and we get the money back. So even if Alice just disappears tomorrow, everybody can go and send their uh, off-chain transaction on-chain, get their Bitcoins back. And they're blind signatures, so really, the server doesn't really know what it's doing. It doesn't even know it's signing Bitcoin or timestamping something or, or whatever. It's just listening to uh, whoever is next in the chain and signs for them. So this does mean that the users have to unblind the signatures and verify what the, uh, the state chain has signed because if you don't do that, uh, you might not have uh, the correct update transaction. So if you go back here, um, it could be that actually Bob's L2 transaction has priority over Carol's. So you have to unblind the signatures and then check that. And yeah, so on the server side, really you just promise to only cooperate with the last owner, right? The last person that uh, is in the chain. And the server, th this is important, right? If we just put a single third party in there, that's not great. So what we do is we replace it with a federation. And you can do this with a Schnorr threshold signature, so uh, it might be like an eight out of 12 federation, something similar to federated sidechains like Liquid. Um, so this whole group has to together cheat in order to do something bad. And all the blind signature requests, uh, they, they have to be published. And this is needed because you need something to prove cheating. Uh, because if the server signs without a user request, uh, that would be cheating. And if the server signs uh, twice for one user, that would also be cheating. And this would be kind of like the analogy to having two histories in a blockchain. So here's uh, kind of a few examples to kind of give, give you a better idea of what's going on. So this is a simplified model of what we, we saw earlier, but it's essentially the same thing. So this is just Bob transferring to Carol. And we're using L2, so this Bob transaction never has to hit the blockchain. Carol can just send uh, hers right away if they want to get out of the state chain. Uh, it's all blinded, so that means that really on the uh, state chain side, you're only seeing uh, this Bob, uh, Bob uh, requested a signature, Carol requ requested a signature, uh, and nothing else. And we're utilizing adapter signatures, and this is important to make sure it's all atomic. So what that means is that um, at first, you share an incomplete signature, and then if one of the signatures gets completed, this automatically completes the other signature, so that kind of forces the uh, state chain to publish both of them. If it just publishes one, the other one automatically becomes known. And we can utilize that to do more than just swapping a single UTXO. We can swap multiple UTXOs. So in this example here, 
Um, so and, and that's one of the uh, you know the issues is that we're since we're sending entire UTXLs, you can think of it as like as a token. Uh, well, what if you want to send something smaller, right? What if you if you have a two Bitcoin UTXL but you want to send one Bitcoin? So then first you got to swap. So let's say Carol here wants to send one Bitcoin but she only has a two Bitcoin UTXL. She just swaps with Bob, and now Bob has two. Uh, yeah, um, yeah. Bob now has uh, one uh, two Bitcoin UTXL. And Carol has two times one Bitcoin, of which she can send one to whoever she wanted to pay. It's possible with other coins. So this is all blockchain agnostic, so it doesn't really matter which blockchain you use as long as it has the requirements. Um, so you could use this for atomic swaps between currencies and swap Bitcoin for Litecoin, et cetera, you know, some kind of DEX or something. Um, and interestingly, you basically have a coin swap protocol here, uh, which is basically off-chain, you know, um, you can use multiple analogies, but it's kind of like off-chain coin join, uh, where you have a bunch of these one Bitcoin UTXLs and you just swap them all blindly, server doesn't know what it's signing, and now you have somebody else's UTXL. So compared to federated sidechains, kind of what's the difference here, right? So we have the full UTXLs only, which is rather sad, which we have a solution for, but more on that later. Um, it is nearly the same trust model as a federated sidechain, meaning you're trusting the federation, However, there are a few differences. So first, uh, you could call this non-custodial because the server or the, the federation really only has one key, right? It's a two of two, one key is with the, uh, the federation and the other key is with all the users. And as long as the federation doesn't receive that key, it literally has no control over the coins. And the second thing is that since there's this off-chain L2 transaction, it means that even if the server disappears, uh, you always get your money back. So, you know, you can imagine this scenario where um, there is some illegal activity on the state chain and some government entity comes to you and says like, hey, uh, you participated in something illegal um, and you can't, actually, uh, you can't actually confiscate those coins, right? Because you only have one of the two signatures, only one of the two keys. So watchtower is needed because we have these L2 transactions, right? So if a prior user sends his user uh, his transaction to the blockchain, that means that you gotta respond to that. So you, you gotta pay attention to the blockchain, similar to Lightning. And yeah, you can't really say this state chain is a money transmitter either because really these blind signatures can be anything. And that's kind of, I think, the interesting thing where um, we're really kind of blurring the line on what it is to send money from one person to another if, if this entity that's kind of facilitating these payments is really oblivious, it doesn't know anything. Um, so that being said, right, it's still a federation, it's not safer than Lightning, Lightning is more safe, period, but it's an interesting set of trade-offs. So worst case, the state chain entity gets a bunch of transitory keys, it unblinds uh, all the signatures and it finds out, oh, hey, I have a bunch of Bitcoins. And then it proceeds to steal all those Bitcoins. And now all the people who don't have exposed transitory keys because the, uh, the uh, server, the federation was unsuccessful to get these uh, transitory keys, those people can withdraw safely on chain. Um, but yeah, so at the end of the day, this is kind of the worst case scenario. Um, but there still uh, is, there remains this yet, it's what I already said. Uh, the confiscation is not possible, right? If, if um, Government comes to you, tries to get those coins. Uh, the federation cannot actually uh, do this, uh, uh, fulfill this request. So this brings us to microtransactions, and that's really one of the uh, you know problematic parts here. Is well, how do we send anything that's smaller than the smallest economically viable UTXO? Uh, you can imagine fees going up to a dollar or something, and now well, if you want to send a dollar, you're not going to create a one dollar UTXO. That makes no sense. So maybe you can create up to $10 UTXOs and maybe you can send those around, but anything smaller than that is not really possible. And you really need something like that if, if you wanna charge fees for your service, right? You gotta receive some payments for, for signing, these trans, uh, signing these transactions or well, signing these messages really, you don't know what you're signing. Uh, and it's also needed when you swap between currencies because the example I gave earlier, I think is 200 Litecoin for two Bitcoin or something. Uh, that's not the same amount, so you know you have these small uh, differences, and you got to pay those as well. And ideally, you want to solve this without adding any trust, right? Because the, the nice thing about this is that this uh, 
uh, the state chain entity or this federation really does not control any of the coins. So what we do is we just create a lightning channel on top of a state chain and this actually works surprisingly elegantly. Um, where instead of sending the money from Bob to Carol, on the state chain you send the money from Bob to Bob and Carol. And because this is Musig, it really is just a single key and from the server's perspective there is no difference between Bob, uh, so between Carol or Carol and Bob. Like it's the same, it's just one key and it, it doesn't really see the difference. And then from there on, on the, um, on the site of the uh, uh, L2 transactions, now Bob and Carol can cooperate and create a lightning channel. So this is how Bob can send 0 0.1 Bitcoin from a one Bitcoin channel uh, to Carol. And this is really nice because uh, you can basically do these atomic swaps uh, and update these lightning channels simultaneously. Uh, if there is some kind of problem uh, and you have to close your channel, let's say you know Bob and Carol have a channel, channel together and Carol stops cooperating, uh, you can just close on-chain without the cooperation of the federation. Uh, and in fact, the uh, transaction size is the same as regular L2, so you're not even you know, adding more uh, on-chain overhead. Uh, you can close and reopen channels without friction because it's all off-chain. Uh, for channel factories, and this is something Anthony Towns uh, pointed out, you can uh, actually add and remove members uh, to, uh, to the channel factory. Uh, which is very uh, convenient uh, in, in terms of um, trying to yeah, find a, a group of people that you continually cooperate with. Uh, so you can imagine a scenario where um, you're starting off your lightning channel but you're not entirely certain who you want to cooperate with and how cooperative they're going to be and first you open it on, the, on a state chain and then later on once you have the stable channel that doesn't really need closing uh, then you move it out of the state chain and on chain where the, you know, you're, you're out of the reach of the federation so that's more secure. So you could see it as kind of like a, a step uh, towards uh, first balancing your channel and then moving it. Um, yeah, so really the, the key insight here is that the nice thing is that with lightning, lightning is completely trustless but you have this problem where the throughput is limited. Right, you can't send more than your uh, roots allow. If there's a route to a person you want to pay and there's only one Bitcoin inside of that route, well, you're never going to be able to pay more than one Bitcoin. Uh, and, but it is divisible, right? And that's the opposite problem we have with state chains where it's no problem. If, if I have a one Bitcoin UTXO, I can give it to anyone. But if I want to send some, some smaller fraction, now I'm in trouble. So we combine the two and it kind of works out really elegantly. And one more example that I should point out uh, is that this also allows you to basically instantly open and uh, create channels with people, right? So if you uh, want to pay a user and they are not a Bitcoin user yet, in Lightning they first have to open a channel with somebody and then you can start paying them. Uh, but with this you can kind of instantly open a channel with them and instantly onboard them onto the Lightning network. So potential use cases, um, basically anything that requires the creation of a UTXO on the Bitcoin blockchain you can now do off-chain. Uh, so value transfer, obviously, lightning channels, balancing, talked about that. Uh, you can do betting channels, so two of three multisig where the, the third uh, arbitrator decides to bet in case of a disagreement. Uh, discrete law contracts by Taj Drajad, that's also interesting to do on, on this, uh, on state chains. Non-fungible RGB tokens, uh, Giacomo Zucco is working on that. Um, and that's, um, yeah, I think BitRefill uh, recently started working on that too, but um, that's um, a way to, you can actually send non-fungible tokens. So that is, um, uh, that's kind of one of the problems we have today if we want to create tokens on, on really any blockchain. You can't send them over Lightning because the problem you have is, yeah, if you know, Alice and Bob have a channel and then Bob and Carol have a channel and let's say both channels have this unique CryptoKitty inside. Well, the CryptoKitty can only move within the channel. So with Bitcoin, you know, they're both the same so you can just move Bitcoins over but the CryptoKitties, uh, you can't move them over uh, through a route. And now with uh, state chains, you can actually move them off chain so that, that's quite elegant. And then there are also uh, non-Bitcoin use cases that I haven't really thought about but again, as I said, we're talking about a blind signing server, so there really is uh, no limits to what you can do with it as long as you do something with signatures. Um, and there is one difference though, and that's that, you know, depending on what kind of signature you're requesting from the server, 
um, you know, you might not be able to have this off-chain L2 type of contract that really allows you to, you know, even if the server goes away and stops signing something, uh, you can still uh, get your Bitcoins out. So depending on your use case, you might want to keep that in mind. So some further topics. Uh, this transitory key uh, that we've sent out from user to user to user uh, could be sent out through a hardware security module. So you could have this hardware security module that um, facilitates the transfer from Bob to Carol to Dave. And generally speaking, hardware security modules are not great uh, because uh, they're hackable and this always adds, you know, if you, if you fully trust in them, it's a problem. But here it's only added security. And even if the hardware security mod module breaks, you still have your off-chain transaction that you can send to the Bitcoin blockchain and you can get your coins back. So it really, in this case, only adds to the security. And worst case, it adds no, none. So that's, that's pretty good. Um, then there are graph withdrawals. Like I said, we're not going to get graph root anytime soon. Uh, but you can imagine a way, uh, this being a way to even redeem forks, where once you get out of the state chain, you get the state chain uh, to sign a graph root key that allows you to then generate whatever uh, transactions you want uh, both on the Bitcoin blockchain or some kind of hard fork if one occurred. Uh, so that's interesting and it's also good uh, for example for ETFs where you have the problem of what coins, what, what hard fork is the ETF going to follow? Uh, and now you can kind of just get rid of that problem by paying out all the, all the coins that, uh, all the hard forks that occurred simultaneously. Um, yeah, so these are more kind of uh, along the lines of open questions, but um, there is uh, some, a minimum amount of historic data that needs to be verified to, to make sure that the state chain is not creating a double history. And some additional research is needed to kind of see like how far we can minimize that. But in theory, uh, you only need to care about the history of the coins that you hold. Uh, if, some, if there's some other coin, because this is a linear history, there's no, you know, with the Bitcoin blockchain, you have this mixing of histories and you have to check everything. But these are really separate blockchains. Every coin is a blockchain, essentially. So, you know, you only verify your blockchain. You only verify your coin. Uh, so there's some, uh, um, yes, yeah, some scalability um, improvements in that sense. And then the second question is about privacy. Um, it seems like uh, we get a lot of privacy, actually, from all these coin swaps and... Um, the way the server signs blindly, but that needs to be researched further. So that's kind of an open question. But at the very least, you got, you got to use Tor, and uh, that might be very good already. But you know, to what degree this is anonymous is not entirely clear to me yet. So yeah, if um, you find this interesting, um, go check out my article on Medium uh, or check me out on Twitter. And uh, yeah, thank you very much for listening. On the uh, Twitter, uh, sorry, on the Medium article, there's also a link to my previous talk and my paper uh, and a mailing list post. So you can find more details there too. Hi. Um, in this blind signature, what exactly is blinded? Um, in other terms, how do I, as a state chain entity, know that um, the UTXO belongs to the correct owner? Um, so that's the, that's the thing, right? You don't really know what you're signing, so that it's really up to the um, rece recipients to, to verify. So if we, if we move the, the, the money from Bob to Carol, then Carol needs to unblind those signatures and verify what was signed. So uh, if, uh, if Bob here requested something that's, that's different from an L2 signature and maybe it just said like, okay, well, send, send me all the coins or something. Uh, if that was the case, then once Carol receives the money on the state chain and unblinds the signatures, Carol will just say, well, that's not a valid payment. So that is, that is basically the security model. M model. And this is similar to uh, Peter Todd's uh, client-side validation, where basically you expect the client to validate whether the payment is valid or not. So there's privacy towards um, the state chain, but not privacy inside the line of signatures. Um, you could, well, the, the server is blinded, whether, um, to what degree privacy is leaked by selectively revealing the history to the user that's getting paid uh, is not entirely clear to me yet. Uh, it still seems pretty okay because you only see a 
linear history. It's kind of like a UTXO that has no change outputs, where, you know, if you remember Chris Belcher's talk, uh, a, lot of, a lot of information is being leaked because you have all these, uh, all this extra information, and that's kind of not there. So it is not entirely clear to me um, what the implications are of that, but it still seems pretty private to me. Thanks. So the security model is that if any previous owner of the same UTXO releases the key to the state chain, then they can steal the money, right? Then the uh, state, uh, the uh, yeah, the federation can steal the money if they get that key. So for that reason, I, I think it's actually quite easy to obtain that key. So I don't consider that part of the security in, in the sense that um, really, at the end of the day, you need the uh, federation to be honest. Uh, I think that's more interesting from the perspective of uh, regulation. Uh, where if, you know, if I really got to confiscate your coins, now I got to go to these users and convince them to give me that key that I don't have. Uh, so that's, uh, it's kind of more of a layer of separation rather than, a, a, I think, a security feature. Okay, so you rely on trusting the state chain because otherwise yes. you do coin joins or coin swaps and you don't know the identity of all the other people that are passing around your private key. Mm -hmm. uh, if anybody of those guys gets hold of the state chain key or the state chain of any of those guys' keys, then the money is gone, right? So I, I, I uh, sorry, but the, with the atomic swaps or uh, in, in any way, like only the gonna, federation if you're can cheat, your right? Exchange UTXOs with people you don't know. You're you're kind of trusting them in some way. Um, no, the people the people they cannot cheat. If the federation doesn't cheat. Then none of the none of the users can cheat. They can out. hack the federation, or the or they. Yeah, can, yeah, yeah. No, no. If, if the federation fails, then the okay. uh, the coins can be stolen. That is that is the bottom line. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you.